Welcome to the Tomorrow Today podcast, Mapping the Future of Business, a podcast where we explore some of the key questions, trends, and insights shaping the future of business. I'm Bushle Lamini. And I'm Graham Codrington. And if you're watching the video, you can see we are together again, which we're really excited. It's nice to have you in my studio. And today's topic is something that's really uh, more relevant than ever. It's the issue of adaptive leadership. In a world that's constantly evolving, and we've been talking about that for the last few episodes, it's shifting, it's changing, it's ever changing. And that probably is now the constant uh, in, in the business world. The big question then is, well, how does this impact leadership? And we believe that the framework adaptive leadership, it's a capital A, capital L, because it's a formal theory of leadership, uh, is one that we think uh, you need to understand. So basically, traditional leadership models don't cut it anymore. And so in this episode, we will be unpacking some of the principles of adaptive leadership. And we'll get to hear from our colleague Keith Coates, whom you've heard in, uh, in the other episode as well. And Keith is really in our team, is the guy that helps leaders put these ideas into action. And um, so we'll discuss practical strategies that you can implement right away in terms of how to lead uh, with adaptive intelligence and how to be a leader that's future fit for a changing world. In episode four of the podcast, we talked about a problem that we often see with some of our clients. And it's the fact that some are not as good as they should be in anticipating disruption. So we talked about some of the techniques that you can use to improve. And um, if you haven't listened to that episode, I will really encourage you to go back and take a good listen to it right now. So if we pick up from that thought, Bosley, that uh, people are not as good as they should be at anticipating disruption, I think it's because people think that the rules of the game, if you like, will keep going. I, I've, I've got sport on my mind. It's the Olympics now while we're recording this. And I, I know you've got into rugby, I think maybe more than before <laughs> with rugby sevens at the Olympics, right? And it's much more it. fun. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's so fast and, uh, you know, I, I can invest 15 minutes and watch the whole game. It's perfect. I love it. <laughs> That's my rugby for an hour. <laughs> and, well, exactly. And there are some players, uh, for example, Dupont, who's the French player well known in the 15s game. Those of you who don't know rugby, there's different versions of rugby. And in the bigger, longer form of the game, he's one of the world's best players. He wanted to get an Olympic gold. And his version of the game isn't played at the Olympics, so he switched over to the shorter, uh, you know, smaller team. And of course, there are different rules. So not completely different, but enough different that in his first few games, he was making a few mistakes because he didn't, he hadn't adapted, adapted yeah. to, to those changes. And I suppose every sporting code is constantly attempting to make those little fine adjustments. Which shoes are you allowed to wear uh, for this game? Or uh, can you do this or change the rules to make it either safer or more competitive? And that's really a nice analogy, yeah. I think, for what we see businesses need to do more of. They, they've got to do what sports people and sporting codes do, make these constant tweaks and adjustments. I like that. I mean, it's about thinking of yourself as a leader in the business world as uh, being a DuPont. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, you have to play uh, the game according to different rules. And so it applies to the business world as much as it applies in the sports world. And one of the key reasons is that anticipating disruption is so hard in business because there is so much disruption happening right now. We often talk about us finding ourselves in the decade of disruption. And this has significant implications for leadership. And in terms of how we think about leadership, how we lead our teams, how we engage with the market in, um, in, in, in an environment that's changing and the context that's shifting all the time. And I think a lot of leaders Think about those changes and shifts in relation to markets, regulations, pricing, supply chain. So mm. they're thinking about it structurally and from an organization design perspective. 
But what we want to focus on in this episode is that if the business is changing, then leadership must change as well. And that's just, you need to think about that statement because we're saying more than just leaders need to take account of the changes taking place. We're saying your picture, your view, your concept of leadership, the way in which you actually lead must also change. And I don't think enough leaders step back and ask themselves, what is my current leadership style and which aspects of my style must change? Most leaders I know sort of just lead by gut feel, just they, they lead the way they think they have to lead. They don't analyze it. And that's what we're hoping we can help people to do. So what you're actually talking about then, Graham, is that um, leaders need to actually change their models for leadership, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. not just um, sort of like change themselves, but the way that we think about leadership, as you've said. So I guess the question would be then, if I were, if I were to ask you to think of an example of a leader, mm -hmm. uh, what jumps to your mind? And I think jumps to most of our listeners' minds. Well, in a sports environment, I suppose we think of the leader as the sports captain, for mm -hmm. example. And often I'm just looking across at my bookshelf there, there's a, too many business books that are linked, say, to military, you know, yeah. and we thinking then you've got the general and the lieutenants and all the rest. And I think all of those models have something uh, similar in concept. Uh, and that is that you promote somebody who's a been there, done that person. Yes. So uh, typically the person who does it the best gets promoted to be the supervisor of everybody else. Then the best supervisors are managers. The best managers are captains in, in the sports environment. Uh, and immediately, as I'm thinking about that, you realize that doesn't always work out well. Because mm. sometimes there's the best player is not a great captain. And I suppose that's part of why those models indicate to us there's a problem with that. That is a big problem in, in business. The, big, the biggest problem is this whole thing about experience and uh, uh, playing a big role in what leadership looks like. And so you're always rising to the level of your previous, uh, of, you know, of your previous engagement. And sort of like that becomes sort of like your limit sometimes mm. because you, you, your experience at that level, maybe you were at a regional level and you did great there and now you are going national or you're going international. Mm. And, uh, and, and, so, and so as a leader, it can be a good thing to have that experience. And I know in business we love experience. Um, but as we think about a fast-changing world, that model of thinking about leadership as, as the been there, done that, is starting to become slightly problematic uh, if we are going to lead into the future. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I guess that lays the foundation for what we're talking about today, adaptive leadership. And yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And we need a model of people who are leaders who haven't got their leadership capability from experience as you say we we need to have some experience you you maybe you can't be a great leader if you've got no experience but we shouldn't be relying on our experience we and and again maybe leaders even in their heads actually say well when i was in sales or when i started in the accounts department this is how we did it uh, I think leaders probably, well, hopefully leaders don't do that specifically. But even so, leadership is often based on the past, whereas I think what we're needing and what you're saying is we need a model of leadership that, that maybe looks uh, looks to the future. Exactly. It's, it's actually, I mean, when you think about it, it's part of a great definition of um, adaptive leadership. It's knowing what to do when no one knows what to do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty tough. So can we think of any models or, of leadership that fit this definition, which is not sort of like not the, the traditional way of thinking about leadership? You know, you've done this, you've, you, you've led so many, and so now you're promoted to this level, and so you're ready to take us forward. Adaptive leadership it requires a different skill, mm -hmm. and it, it requires a different kind of intelligence. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's just the conversation we were having before we started <laughs> recording about our daughters, um, both of whom are now 
out of school. Well, I've got uh, we've both got multiple children, but our, our, our daughters that we were thinking of are, are both in the sort of creative space. There's new th thinking. Your your daughter's heading out into university, and you know, looking at video work and and they, the technology that they need. And so, in my mind, if you're asking, what's a good model then? If if maybe captain of a sports team or a general in an army is not a good model, I think parenting is actually a great model. And maybe we don't think of parents as leaders. Of course, they are. Yeah. But parenting is. <laughs> I don't know about you, but every time I've thought, I'm just starting to understand this phase of life. Yes. You know, I'm just starting to understand and get my head around what my children need from me. I wake up and now they've grown again and they've changed again. I mean, parenting is like this constant adapting, shifting of the way that we think. So maybe it's, parenting it's, is a better It's like heading cats. And uh, <laughs> if, our, if our children are listening, uh, just switch <laughs> off at this point. But it really is like that. It's um, where, where you are dealing with that constant change. Yeah. And so parenting could be a good, a good example because, <laughs> yeah, like, uh, think about it as a parent. Like, what are the rules, uh, right? And so, yes, we know about the basic ki kind of things, but not only are the people you are leading changing themselves, mm -hmm. the context in which they're finding themselves is also changing. And so um, your instruction, your direction, your guidance, all of that needs to be uh, you know, taken into account uh, or needs to be guided by the fact that the rules are changing and the environment is changing and so your leadership yeah. needs to change as well. I suppose we have to be careful. Any any model or picture is imperfect. Mm. Uh, you know, I think there might be some parents out there who are different parenting style from you and me, who who maybe are authoritarian and saying, "Hey, Boothley and Graham, your problem with your parenting is you don't tell your children what to do and sort them out." You know, um, and so yes, I mean, obviously there are different styles of parenting, but I think we're talking about a style of parenting that tries to be engaging, adaptive, responsive. Yeah. Uh, for me, another model might be um, leading in a non-profit world. This is something mm -hmm. that both you and I uh, have personal familiarity with, where you've basically got volunteers on your staff. So you can't just come in and say, right, you have to do this, or sorry, the weekend's cancelled because we, we're running up against a deadline. Um, and I, I wonder if business people might... Uh, if they play a, a, a thought experiment with themselves and say, imagine every one of your staff members wins the lottery this evening. And now tomorrow, they don't have to come to work to earn money. They come to work if they want to or not. Money's now out of the equation. In other words, we've just turned your staff into a volunteer organization. How many of your people would come <laughs> to work? Would yeah. you? Would you come to work? <laughs> and I think that's it. Uh, it requires a mind shift to to manage uh, volunteers um, it because they choose to be there they choose to come and uh, whether they continue to choose to come <laughs> is really based on uh, how the environment that we create so now we have to think about those things you know in the past you only you you only thought about okay um, you know do, do have I equipped them for what they need to do uh, you know, for them to to build widgets. Uh, you know, have I uh, am I am I paying them enough for them to actually uh, bother to leave their house and come and and so on. We need to move way beyond those things now. And and the and the truth of the matter is, actually, in today's world, if you want to attract the top talent, uh, that's going to make you stand out in the marketplace. That's going to make you stand out you need to start thinking about treating your team, your staff, your employees, not only as paid, um, you know, paid, paid people, but actually as volunteers. And that requires a different kind of thinking yeah. and a kind of way of doing things. So you, you treat them not, <clears throat> not in a weird way, you treat them as your children. In other words, you want to be, have this parental engagement, good parental engagement with them. You want to maybe think of them as volunteers. And therefore, we've now started to unpack some new models. Absolutely. And I think this is the point we really want to drive home in this episode, that it isn't leadership in a future-focused organization. 
is not just saying your you need to apply your thinking to a changing marketplace around there you need to apply your thinking to changing yourself Absolutely. to changing your actual approach to leadership your the dna of of your leadership excellent so let's get to our interview in this episode we're very excited because we are joined by our colleague keith coates who is a world expert on adaptive leadership and has a great way of explaining some of these concepts. And we asked another, another one of our colleagues, uh, Jude uh, Fulston, who runs our digital operations and heads up our Future Smart Parent and Future Smart Teacher Clubs to chat to Keith uh, about adaptive leadership. So it's going to be very exciting. Um, we're going to be having Jude uh, on onto, onto this episode. So you're going to enjoy this conversation. And so without much further ado, let's take you there. Hi, Keith. So today we are talking about adaptive leadership. Um, so welcome. I think it's a great topic. Um, but let's start with the very basics, right? What is it and why is it so important um, in today's ever-changing business environment? Thanks, Jude. Yeah, I think it's uh, an essential topic to be talking about. Very simply, adaptive leadership is about helping people make progress through their toughest challenges. So when you think about that in the context of continual change in which we live, uh, it's required all the time. And why it's so important is simply because if you don't adapt, you die. And uh, we know today organizations, leaders in their own personal style and their behavior and practice have to be adaptive right through to their very core. So what does it mean to be adaptive, I suppose? I guess it means that you, you need to be constantly changing and willing to change. So that means you need to be willing to identify and um, challenge your limiting orthodoxies. And that is much easier said than done, of course, because a lot of very successful companies have orthodoxies that are hard baked into their DNA. But in a context of change, which is the external context, companies always have to be willing to reinvent themselves. I remember a quote from The Economist way back in 2005, for thereabouts, that said that uh, real innovation is not product and service innovation, but rather the ability to change your business model. So that work is really the work of leadership. And if leaders aren't willing to recognize where they might be out of step or falling behind or off the pace when it comes to contextual, global contextual change, there will be problems. And adaptability is a concept that fits into linking the external context and what you need to be as a leader and what you need to do as an organization. So Keith, um, I know that being adaptive and change, it, of course, it's the role of leadership, but it's hard for, for anyone um, at any level. The adaptive leadership framework, um, I know at Tomorrow Today, we always like to give our clients an actual framework to, to work with um, and to make sense of. Um, adaptive leadership, is there a, a framework that you can, can talk about? Yep, there are two, there are two um, uh, bases to this, if you like. The actual framework of adaptive leadership is a work that Ron Halflich Halflich is a professor at, the, at Harvard University, and so we need to acknowledge him. He provides the adaptive leadership framework that we have embraced and use uh, with our clients. And in that context, he talks about the distinction between adaptive challenges and technical challenges. An adaptive ch a technical challenge, uh, your problem is known. Uh, the solution is known as well, and that's where experience matters a great deal because it stands to reason that the more experience you've got, the more solutions you've got access to. And very often the authority figure is the one that takes the solution and applies it to the problem and says, do this. So there are a lot of very serious and complex technical problems that leaders today are facing, but they know the problem, they know the solution or have access to a solution, and they simply apply it. In an adaptive challenge, it's very different. An adaptive challenge, the problem is not known. So the problem requires definition. It requires a diagnostic approach. Why is it not working? Why aren't we getting the results that we need? 
what is it we need to learn where can we go for that learning so there's a whole different approach you just know that things aren't working as they were intended to work the solution if there is one also requires learning and all the stakeholders have to be involved and so you can see the very sharp distinction between technical challenges and adaptive challenges and a large part of the call is identifying which part of the challenge that you are facing as a leader is adaptive in nature and is technical in nature. Very often, what happens is leaders just treat every problem they face as a technical problem. And so they throw solution after solution. It doesn't work. And you often hear this comment eight months down the road. Um, we've had this conversation eight months ago. Nothing has changed. So in Ron's uh, approach to framing adaptive leadership, he distinguishes between adaptive and technical challenges. He has the wonderful analogy of the dance floor on the balcony, and he makes the assertion that too often, too many leaders are spending too much time on the dance floor. That's what they're good. That's what they know. That's what got them promoted. But in today's context, leaders need to be on the balcony more than on the dance floor. Why is that? Well, because it's from the balcony they can see the changes happening on the dance floor. Um, he makes a very sharp distinction between leadership and authority, and that's a very detailed conversation, but um, a very important one in today's context. And very simply, um, leaders can uh, lead without authority. Because you have authority does not mean to say you're leading. Uh, and if you don't have authority, it doesn't mean to say you can't lead. So that and many other things Ron packs into the framework of adaptive leadership. His book is called The Practice of Adaptive Leadership, and I would highly recommend it. So that's that's the one framework, an understanding of what it is we mean when we talk about adaptive leadership. The second base or the second framework that I was alluding to was one that I came across in my research that I was doing on adaptability and what it means to be adaptable. And quite by accident, I stumbled across a white paper written by two marine biologists by the name of Gunderson and Holling. And their paper was titled The Adaptability of Coral Reefs in the Pacific. Now, that is as far as you can get from the corporate world that we're involved in. But I was going to dismiss it other than the fact that I love diving and do scuba. And so at a personal level, I was drawn to the paper and I started reading it with no thought that it would be of relevance to what I was actually looking for. And, uh, you know, I had one of those serendipity moments, serendipity, finding a hidden treasure in an unexpected place when you're not looking for it. Because in their paper on adapting coral reefs for the Pacific, they identified four key characteristics that constitute adaptive intelligence. So if you want to develop adaptability as part of your DNA, they gave us four key insights. And very simply, the key insights were embracing change and uncertainty. The second was inviting learning, being a learner. And you would have seen in Ron's model that if you're not a learner, at diagnosing the problem. And if you're not a learner at finding the solution, you simply can't be an adaptive leadership a leader. So their model, embracing change and uncertainty, inviting learning. The third one was activating difference. And uh, if I went to any leadership team in the world today and said, do you want to be more adaptive? I'm sure 99.9% .9 of them would say, absolutely. Well, then if you want to be more adaptive, you need to activate difference. And what that means is it gives us a completely different springboard from which to deal with this critical subject of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Very often there's a real tiredness and a cynicism towards that topic in the corporate world. But if you understand that it's essential and an essential part of adaptability, a whole different platform from which to address it. And then the last one, was the need to give control, to understand that authority needs to flow downwards in an organization towards those at the coalface in order for them to make quick and responsible decisions. So in Gunnelson and Holling's model, we call it the DNA because DNA has four elements to it. The DNA of what it takes to be adaptively intelligent are embracing change and uncertainty, not just tolerating it, embracing it, inviting learning, being a learner, 
activating difference and giving control. And so that, those would be the two bases, the theory of adaptive leadership and what it takes to develop adaptive intelligence. Sure. Those, um, cause you can dive deep into, into all of that, right? So we really are just touching on, on the top of this iceberg, um, with those four elements. And I'm going to say them again, just to get them into my head, it's, um, embracing change and uncertainty, um, inviting learning, um, activating difference and giving control, um, all, all things that sound, I suppose, quite simple on, on the, the face of things but really there's nothing simple about it right um for for anyone um and then keith just also to go back to the the technical and the um adaptive uh, challenges um because if i'm thinking about those four elements uh inviting learning might be one of them and to try and get my head around the, the, the difference between technical and adaptive um just just explain to me or, or perhaps you could give me an example of an adaptive challenge that leaders um could have could could face just to almost yeah just to give an example so they come they come wrapped up in so many different ways and often well disguised but an adaptive challenge is simply when you, things aren't working quite as well as you anticipated them working so um, a specific example, uh, let me, you put me on the spot here, let me, let me generalize it. Let's say you have a well-worn approach to, um, to building a team. Um, and suddenly the things that used to always work well for you to build that team spirit and that kind of oneness, etc., somehow just aren't gelling, just aren't working. Um, and so you double up your efforts, you double down, you work harder at the things that have worked in the past. That would be maybe an adaptive challenge, um, which requires you to step back and say, hold on, what's going on here? Why is it not working? Uh, what is it we need to learn? Uh, and taking a more diagnostic approach to defining the problem, because maybe it's your team age has dropped down in your team. You've now got a younger team. And from a different generation, the things that worked in an older generation simply don't have the same traction and same uh, impact with a younger generation. And you've got to now step back and work out, how do I motivate this younger team that I'm now responsible for leading? So that would be maybe a very superficial example, but the, the essence of it is that what you were once doing is no longer working. Hence the comment I made earlier where you're sitting in a meeting and somebody with exasperation says, we were having the same conversation eight months ago. You've just been going round and round, working hard, but making no progress. That's a sure sign that you have an adaptive challenge that you haven't recognized and you're throwing technical solutions at it. So the easiest way to identify an adaptive challenge is it's just not working. And Instead of, as I say, doubling mm. the known approaches, you've got to step back and ask a whole lot of questions. And once you've asked those questions, you're probably going to realize you don't have a known solution. And so the solution requires new learning as well. Where are we going to go? Who can we ask? What is it we need to learn? How do we need to change? And that that is very different from a technical solution. Um, Facing a technical problem at a personal level, I have a friend, for instance, who many years ago had a headache, went to the doctor, and I'm simplifying this journey now, but after a few tests, they found out that she had a, a brain tumor, and it was a known problem. We can identify you have a brain tumor. In her case, the surgeon said it's operable and we need to operate immediately, which they did. So technical problems can be life-threatening and can be very complex, but you know what the problem is and there is a known solution. In a changing world, I would assert that more and more leaders are facing an increasing amount of adaptive challenges. And so this is why experience doesn't get you through. Experience is only good insofar as you're facing known problems. And in a fast changing world, uh, leaders simply cannot rely on experience. They have to be learners. They have to be willing to develop the capacity to be more adaptive, both personally and collectively within their teams and organizations. Thanks, Keith. 
And I, I suppose maybe I'm making an assumption now, but just because of human nature, um, well, maybe I'll speak personally, but sort of falling back on the, the knowledge that you have and uh, going back to and, and making the problem or starting off with the problem as a technical challenge is that much easier because you have the knowledge and you have the experience. And so am I right to say that um, I suppose just an awareness of, of the difference between adaptive and technical challenge is, is a great place just to start for, for those leaders who have been trying the same thing and they find that it's not working. Um, yeah. I think you're right, Jude, and I think that uh, one of the challenges today for leaders is who have been taught for so long to lead from the front, to have the answers, to be in control, and all of that kind of uh, that kind of rhetoric, is that today the smart leader is somebody who recognizes they don't have all the information, they don't have all the knowledge, and control is a little bit of a myth that they've got to have a different approach to their leadership philosophy and their leadership practice. Um, and there's perhaps nothing more dangerous today than somebody who doesn't know, but thinks that they know. And so this is where subjects like the humility and leadership come in, the need for curiosity, the need for questions, and all of those things put together uh, into a persona of a leader who says, you know what, um, yes, I had the responsibility to lead, but there's lots that I don't know. There's lots that I need to learn and is open and willing to do that in a way that doesn't create insecurity because very often leaders have said to me, Keith, if I, if I ask too many questions and show too much uncertainty, people will start to become insecure. And so there is a, a, a balance to that. Leaders need to be self-assured without always believing that they have the answers. And I think that is entirely possible. Very insightful, Keith. Thank you. I, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a big topic, obviously, but I think we've, we've given it a good overview. Um, I suppose before we wrap up, um, if there was one key takeaway that perhaps we haven't mentioned that maybe I haven't asked the right questions of you to, um, is there anything sort of, of, of real, great importance that um, you need the, the listeners of, of this episode to hear, um, or have we covered um, the top level stuff? Um, I think we've covered most of it, but here's what I'd say. If someone was listening to us and said, okay, where do I start? I mean, I, in theory, I get this, but where do I start? I would say start by counting questions. Um, because so much of adaptive leadership is contingent on asking good questions, leaders uh, like yourself, those watching or listening, need to become comfortable with questions. So at your next team meeting, count the number of questions that are asked and uh, the answer that you get to that might surprise you. You might have a team that's full of questions and that doesn't surprise you because it reflects on the quality of the decisions that you make and the level of participation. But on the other side, you might come out horrified at how few questions were asked, even though there was a very robust discussion. Um, start to develop an awareness in your own personal life on a daily basis. In conversations, are you always just sharing opinion or responding to opinion? How many questions do you ask? Are you comfortable with open-ended questions? I had an experiment the other day, it didn't go too well, but I thought I was gonna try and go through an entire day, just an average day in my life, only asking questions. And it became a bit of a game that kind of uh, fed on itself. But, but what I'm saying is this, as a leader, cultivate a comfort and a skill around asking questions, because if you can be that kind of person, um, then I think you're well on the way to develop an adaptability that will serve you in good stead. Well, you can see now why we're so passionate about the concepts that underpin adaptive leadership. It really is a fantastic framework uh, for leading in a crazy, chaotic world um, that is filled with so much that's thrown at you that, uh, that, that you really have to be on your toes all the time. But which part of the model grabs you um, and grabs your attention, Graham, as you think about this? You know, from what Keith was saying, I think that where I've seen people really see the benefit of this adaptive leadership model as a formal framework is 
distinguishing between technical and adaptive challenges. And I think what Keith said was really important there, that we've got to separate those, those things out. If we attempt to deal with these adaptive challenges using that technical mindset, coming with our past experience, coming with approaches that have worked before, we get stuck. Mm. And, and I, I, I think when I speak to a lot of leaders, they think, oh, why doesn't my team understand this stuff? Why do we keep coming back to things? And so for me, and I use this even now in my personal life, mm. if I'm feeling I'm stuck in a relationship or <laughs> let's go back to talking about our kids again, you know, if you're feeling I'm not, uh, somehow I don't think I'm getting through to my kids. I don't think, well, they're idiots or, uh, you know, let me just say it again and say it louder. I begin to think, is there an adaptive issue here? Is there an adaptive mm. challenge behind it? And then ask those great questions like, do I have to learn something? Do we have to get more people involved? All the, those factors Keith was talking about then become what new learning do we need? What control needs to be given up? And I think they, it just creates this lovely framework for interrogating the world I live in and how I respond to it. What comes out of all of this is the realization that adaptive leadership can take a lifetime to learn. It's mm -hmm. not something that uh, you're just going to listen to this podcast and then you've got it. Well, maybe it will happen for you, but I don't think so. <laughs> so every time we work with the model and every time, even ourselves, uh, we learn something new. And uh, every time new clients um, work with us and, and we require uh, sort of like something different to engage with them and we discover and apply new aspects of adaptive leadership, we discover more and and i think that's what we want you to take away from this is that when you think about adaptive leadership it's about thinking about how you can take your leadership where you are right now and continue to to build on it and if you would like more in-depth insights around this please feel free to contact us we love the stuff it's part of something that really energizes us mm. and uh, and we're very happy to share. Having said that though, and I agree with you, there's always something to learn and I'm even nervous that real adaptive leadership gurus who might listen to this episode think, ah, you guys are making it too simplified. That's true. Uh, you know, you really, it's, ne it's not something you ever finish learning because it's almost a state of being or a, or a mindset shift rather than just a set of skills. But... There are a few practical things that, that we can talk about. Not comprehensive, as you've said. If, if people really are captured by this, they should contact us. We'll be happy to chat more. But uh, let's maybe just quickly, as, as we head towards the, the, the end of the podcast, just give some people some practical ideas. Um, so, for example, uh, from everything we've said so far, it should make sense that coming into a leadership space, if you're thinking about how do I change my leadership? The maybe an older versions of leadership are, you are the person who's supposed to have the answers. Your team comes to you, they ask questions, you've got to have all the answers. And I think what I've seen the best adaptive leaders have had a default settings shift to saying, I'm the one who asks questions. Uh, if you know what I mean by the Socratic method, they respond by asking questions. There's a, there's a book we could re recommend called Humble Inquiry mm -hmm. uh, by Shine uh, is the name of the author. And it's about the, the subtle art of asking, not telling. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you can then add to that a layer of curiosity. Yeah. I think adaptive leaders uh, build not only in themselves, but in their teams, the sense of we can ask those questions. We can engage with digging in. We want to not only know what and how and who and when, but we also want to know why. Mm -hmm. And we get behind the scenes and we're prepared to ask some tough questions. On that one, I mean, I, I think a very simple practical thing that, mm -hmm. that leaders can do, uh, you know, at your next leadership meeting where you have your senior leaders uh, in the organization, uh, one of the things, that, especially when you're engaging uh, around strategy and you're engaging around where we're going next in our organization, instead of just thinking about what we need to do, where we need to go, go um, you could actually take some time to say, 
uh, what questions should we be asking that we're not currently asking? Mm. And that just basically give a bit of time in your strategic engagement mm. to actually come up with some really, really good questions. And, and don't make it easy, mm. you know, to say, don't, you know, yeah, as much as we ask the obvious, but let's also interrogate the things that maybe we don't want to ask. Yeah. And, uh, and and get there, you know. And, and we're not talking here, Wesley, about a leader who uses questions as a weapon. Yes. You know, it's not those passive-aggressive questions that, yes. like, force people in a corner. We're talking about curiosity mm. and insight questions. Yeah. You know, so it, 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 it's curiosity to go deeper and ask why. And then it's questions that genuinely you're throwing out to say, I really want to know, I'm interested, I'm, mm. I'm engaging here. What you've said there is a really good example of another adaptive leadership principle that's called spending time on the balcony. Absolutely. Some people, and in psychological terms, people call this a fishbowl experience where maybe there's a group of people who, in, who are doing the work and then there's another group of people around them who are sort of observing and can give a observer insights and that's often valuable in a meeting. Uh, but the balcony picture is if, if the dance floor or, or the working environment is the job that has to be done, sometimes you have to get off of the dance floor, off of the working floor, climb the stairs and stand on the balcony to just see the bigger picture, give yourself space and time. Practically, what we mean by that is maybe allocate a half an hour meeting once a month with your team, and it's a labeled balcony meeting. Everybody knows what it is. It's not your to-do list. It's not your task list. It's not checking in with the work that has to be done. It's those bigger questions, bigger picture engagement. So balcony time, curiosity questions, humble inquiry. These are key components of uh, adaptive leadership. What else have you got? Well, embrace difference is really a good, um, you know, it's, it's a good element of adaptive leadership. And, uh, and of course, when we talk about embracing difference, um, yes, we are talking about diversity. That, that's part of embracing difference. But it doesn't just end there with diversity the way that we think about diversity as in visual diversity or underrepresented groups. You do have to take time to think about that. So as leaders, we always need to be asking ourselves, um, you know, are we creating the space that allows uh, difference um, and diversity to, to, to be embraced and leveraged in this organization? Mm-hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, most most organizations actually are, are, are run and created to not embrace difference, not embrace diversity. They, they, it's it's the most the the, 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 the sameness is embraced. Mm. The, 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 the the uniformity is embraced, and so it takes a different mindset to say how do I lead in a way that embraces difference. Mm. Uh, and so on the diversity side of things, it means that I think about what types of diversity do we are, we are we embracing in this organization? Are we thinking about visible diversity? And are we thinking about underrepresented groups? And, um, and, and so practically, uh, I think an example of what happens when we don't do this <laughs> is, uh, is, a, is an example with that pen company that created a, a pen for women. And you know what happened as a result of for, for that, right? They charged more money for it, and uh, and they made it pink. And, oh, and pink, of course, <laughs> for women. It's the only color. <laughs> now you know what was the reaction. The reaction was like we've been using men pens all these years, and 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 yes, you might you you know I've had some pushback sometimes, Graham, when I when I've shared that example where people are like, but. But shouldn't we be doing that? Shouldn't we be thinking about different demographics and how we're reaching out to them and all of that? In doing that, how are you making sure that you've created the space for that difference to be in the room when the decisions are made? Because they could have done this product outreach or whatever you want to call it differently if the women in the room had been listened to and they most likely would have said, don't go about it this way. Yeah. And, and so embracing difference is about really getting into that space where you, um, 
you actually encourage and invite difference. Mm. Um, you even create an empty seat at the boardroom that is representing the people that are not in the room. Mm. Where you say, who is not in the room and how can we lead with them in There's mind? another great question, right? Who is not in the room and how do we bring their voices in? Now, your example flows nicely to uh, another uh, characteristic of adaptive leadership, and that is about giving up control. Mm -hmm. Keith already mentioned this, but I think it's important to just say, in what ways can you give control? It might be inviting other voices and then allowing those voices to take the control of the process beyond that. Mm. Um, whereas you, it, so it's not just listening and then saying, well, we've ticked the box called listening, but it's actually saying, okay, I like, well, maybe even I don't like what I've heard, but I'm prepared to give you a chance to run with it. Give control away. But uh, mm. Keith, Keith talked nicely uh, about that. Uh, we talked about this giving control uh, in, in previous episodes. Yes. And, and I think because we, the reason we spoke about, about this again is that when you think about what we're talking about here in anti-fragility, mm -hmm. there's so much similarities and so many connections that, that, that are coming in here. So you will notice if you have listened to the previous episode that there's quite an overlap between uh, what we've been talking about and the tips and advice that we gave in that episode. But when you think about adaptive leadership and anti-fragility, they're really two sides of uh, the same coin. And, um, and, and, but, but this very much, this adaptive leadership framework is applying the lens of leadership and how we lead. Whereas anti-fragility is thinking about the whole organization or the whole way of we do things. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot here uh, for people that we've that we've given in in, in, in this episode. But as we said, uh, there's a whole lot more uh, that we are always willing to share with you no, to get in touch. Exactly. With I, I I wish we could get away with a three or four hour podcast here we can't, <laughs> because there's all sorts of other things like promoting new learning, experimenting more, how to manage loss. That's a huge part of the adaptive leadership framework how to get, uh, how to not be scared of disagreeing with each other. Yeah. And you can add psychological safety on that. And a lot of it comes down to DNA, yeah. to our, our culture of our teams and this DNA inside ourselves. And as leaders, we need to be thinking, what do we need to do more of, do less of? What do we need to create and discard? not just of the organizational systems around us, mm. but of our leadership models themselves. So as both Les said, if we've sparked your interest and uh, you are not that familiar with adaptive leadership and you want more information, uh, th this episode we're inviting you, maybe even more than the others, to contact us for more information. We think there's a secret magic key to the future here in adaptive leadership. But we hope that what we've shared with you now and uh, Keith and Jude as well has been interesting. So, uh, Boothle, uh, I am very excited about the book that you're going to be reviewing in this week's episode. Let's get to that now. Well, as we do in every episode, uh, here's the review uh, or summary of uh, a valuable resource that we recommend uh, that you go and look at uh, based on the topic that we've discussed today. And uh, what's different is that actually we're recommending one of our own resources. We don't usually do this, but this is a special occasion. Okay, so the book we are recommending this week is Leading in a Changing World. This is an updated edition of the book. So it's lessons for uh, future focused leaders. And it is by Keith Coates and dun, 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 Graham Codrington. And um, uh, yeah, so now, to get more into this topic of adaptive leadership, um, this book has been updated from its original uh, version. It's, it's really about helping us to lead in a changing world, which is about the current and future challenges that leaders uh, are facing. It explores what type of thinking is, is required, the behaviors, the habits, uh, that leaders will need in order to successfully navigate, uh, the, uh, you know, this unfolding future. Uh, and, and again, what's exciting about this one is that uh, this revised edition came then after, after, the, after 2020. So it's now like looking 
uh, at a very disrupted world. Uh, I'm, I'm not allowing Graham to say anything about this book because I'm talking about uh, about the authors. I think um, they do an okay job in terms of, of this, but but for seriously, it's really it's really packed with some really really good content, and it's got both uh, the breadth and depth uh, of uh, as as an essential resource uh, for your own leadership journey. So what I love about this is not just about adaptive leadership, it's about being a future-focused leader. So everything that we've been talking about uh, from all the previous episodes is also going to be something that you're going to pick up from the book. But it's easy to read, there's lots of fun examples and, and, uh, and, and a great book overall, despite its authors. So enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Mosley. I appreciate you doing that. I don't think my daughters have read the book, so I'm glad that at least my colleagues have. Uh, I'm not sure about my mother. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us on, on this episode. I want to leave you with just a final thought. And uh, I've said this already, but I want to say it again, because it's about your leadership style. And too many leaders just lead by instinct. They and yeah, we go on the odd leadership course. Yeah, you can even read good leadership books um, to get you into this. But I think the leadership task needs to be examined. In other words, you need to look in yourself and make decisions about what type of leader you want to be. And the adaptive leadership model invites you to give up control, to ask more questions, to approach leadership from an adaptive challenge perspective to shift the way you lead and so for me if, if, if leaders are listening to this the, the challenge to you is to do a lot of work on yourself and to do the work that it takes to upgrade your leadership style your leadership approach your leadership dna and we hope that we've inspired you on wherever you are in that journey thanks for listening to another episode of the Tomorrow Today podcast. We hope that you found it insightful and helpful for your business journey. So please go ahead and check out the show notes and uh, recap on what was covered and follow us on social media uh, with the provided links, as well as remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you are listening to us right now. See you in our next episode of the Tomorrow Today podcast, Mapping the Future of Business. Thank you.